Welcome back committee. Uh, that was a quick two minute break. Um, and amazingly enough, we are right on schedule here this morning. Uh, we only have a few minutes this morning with uh, with Kendall Smith, so I want to dive right into the, the next topic. Um, la in the last biennium, this committee spent a lot of time uh, working on the details of uh, cannabis uh, for uh, retail cannabis bill, and uh, so I thought it would be helpful for us to take a review of the of uh, the timelines that were set forward into statute with that bill. Um, and since we only have um, Ms. Smith for a few minutes this morning, I wanted to give her an opportunity to update us on um, on where we are in the timeline of um, board. Uh, cannabis control board applications and um, and getting those to the nominating committee and then we'll go back for a, a, an overview of the timeline and the bill as it passed um, with our legislative council. So Kendall, thank you for being with us this morning. Yes, good morning everybody. Uh, my name is Kendall Smith. I'm the Governor's Director of Policy Development and Legislative Affairs. And thank you for the invitation to join you for a few minutes this morning around the status of the Cannabis Control Board and getting that off the ground. Um, so again, I know uh, Michelle from Ledge Council will probably walk you through the bill again in a few minutes, um, but how the Cannabis Control Board is to get up and running is uh, that basically the governor needs to send a list of names to a nominating committee, um, which I believe uh, Vice Chair Gannon is on. Um, and then the nominating committee vets the names that we send and sends the people that they feel are well qualified back to the governor um, for ultimate appointment. And I believe the statute is no less than five names per seat. Um, and it's pretty um, broad in terms of what would make somebody well qualified or the uh, cannabis control board members having to have have any certain background. So that being said, um, we posted a job application um, and announcement online for the Cannabis Control Board because these are full-time state jobs. That application period closed the end of December. Um, we also tried to take some time to do some diligence forwarding that link and that information around to the many different stakeholder groups that were interested in this bill um, as it was being crafted and moving forward through the legislature. We got, I went and looked this morning, I'd say roughly between 80 and 90 um, applications um, or people that reached out and said they were interested in being considered. We have been going through those names and the governor plans to send a list of names to the nominating committee this week. Um, and then one of the governor's appointees on that committee, his name is Nick Lopez. Um, he works for the Department of Human Resources. He may have testified actually in your committee over the past couple of years. Um, he is one of our appointees and he um, either has or is about to send a note to um, the rest of the members of the nominating committee to meet next week and go through those those names to then send um, individuals back to the governor. So that's that's where we are. Um, we're hoping uh, to get this moving as you all are as well. Um, with that, I can take any questions, but that's a pretty good summary about the status. Thank you, Kendall. I, I appreciate the update um, on, uh, on where we are in that process. Um, so is it your expectation that uh, that the administration appointees to the nominating committee are uh, are going to help facilitate some of the um, administration of the document? Yeah, at, yep, at least at the at the outset. Um, again, once the committee organizes itself, um, can kind of figure out some of those nuances, but to at least get it off the ground. Um, yeah, we asked again, Nick Lopez from DHR uh, to try to convene everybody and um, once we send the list. So our three appointees for folks awareness to the nominating committee from the governor's um, side are again, Nick Lopez from uh, Human Resources, Sabina Haskell, she serves on the uh, Board of Liquor and Lottery and is a former Lottery Commission Chair and Secretary Anson Tebbets from the Agency of Agriculture. Thank you, John Gannon. Thanks. Um, 
So, so Kendall, thank you for coming today. Um, are we just getting a list of names or are we going to get actually the applications and, or resumes? I, I, that's a great question. I would assume, and I will confirm this, um, Rep Gannon, that we would send you the, like the resumes or whatever information they provided us um, with the names. Okay. And, and just another thing, um, there's been um, a lot of trouble scheduling a meeting um, mm -hmm. because I'm not sure um, some of the administration members of the nominating committee understand how difficult it is for the legislative members to meet from Tuesday to Friday. Mm -hmm. um, Monday is mm -hmm. an ideal day because we, we don't, the legislature is not in session. Um, and that has caused, um, I think, a lot of challenge in trying to schedule a meeting. I can uh, reiterate that point um, with the administration's uh, members. Thank you. You're welcome. And I should just add that the the legislative members, um, as, as Kendall pointed out, I'm, I'm a member. Um, the other House member is Janet Ansel, um, Chair of House Ways and Means. Um, the two Senate members are um, Jeanette White, um, Senator Jeanette White, who's chair of House GovOps, and um, Senator Chris Pearson. Other questions from committee members? All right, we have a very quiet bunch this morning. Thank you, Kendall, for being with us and giving us that update. Um, I look forward to hearing uh, that there is a meeting of the nominating committee scheduled so that they can review the application materials. Sounds good. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye. All right, so we will uh, shift gears now and help to orient those of you who didn't sit through the last two years of work that we did on this bill. Um, and I have asked Michelle Childs, who is our legislative council um, attorney who, uh, who helped craft this bill to come and share with us uh, sort of um, a timeline of how we build the Cannabis Control Board and what the steps are along the way um, and give folks an opportunity to understand uh, a little bit of the details uh, about the way the bill was crafted so that in, in the event that we uh, need to come back to any issues within uh, the, the cannabis realm and the standing up of the board that this committee will at least have a, um, an initial overview of, um, of how the bill was crafted. So thank you, Michelle, for being with us this morning. I understand you have some documents that have been sent to our committee. I do. Um, and sorry, I, I'm still a little new with the whole sharing thing. So, um, so, but um, I, so there's a few, you have a few new folks on here. So I'll just introduce myself because um, there's a couple faces I don't recognize or I know the names, but that's about it. So my name is Michelle Childs. Um, I'm Office of Legislative Counsel and I typically staff the judiciary issues and um, cannabis really, now that it's been legalized, is not so much in, uh, in the Judiciary Committees any longer, but I'm still continuing to work on it because I've been working on it since I've been here and I've been in the office for about 22 years. So no sense giving it up now. Um, so I'm going to take you through a little bit on uh, Act 164, just a really broad overview of what's there. Um, and so I, I know a lot of you, like, you know, I look and see Representative Anth uh, Anthony, he knows it from Ways and Means, right? But then other folks who might have been on other committees or if you're a freshman, uh, you know, you may only have a little basic knowledge. And, um, and anybody who wants some information more in greater detail, feel free to email me and we can have a chat on the phone or anything like that. I'm happy, happy to help with that. Um, so. Uh, I'm going to share, I have a little uh, just PowerPoint just to kind of hit the highlights of the, of the act. Um, and so here I go. I'm going to try to share the screen. So um, Michelle, um, yep. I, I think what we are trying to work towards, and I'm sorry that we didn't have a chance to 
talk about this before you came in. We're gonna, we all have a second device that we can use to follow along with the document. Um, and so what we'll do is we'll call the document up from our site and then we can still see each other as we- Oh, that is good to know go because that. that's always what I do, but then a lot of the other committees don't do that. And so I, cause I usually have my Zoom on my iPad and then so I can use my laptop, which I right. think- Right, we are, we are working to establish what our, what our norms are based on the technology that we have access sure. to. So we'll um, try following along. Well, now I have to figure out how I can look at it now. <laughs> it's all just on one talk because it's all on the same screen now. Um, well, you can certainly minimize your Zoom screen um, if you have it called up already on your, uh, right. on your computer. And you won't see us, but I will interrupt you if I see people raising hands. Okay, all right, or if you see my cats or my dogs wreaking havoc in the back or things like that, you just let me know if there's a problem. Hey, it sounds like fun. <laughs> okay, all right. Um, so I'm gonna start with the little slide presentation. Um, it starts to Green Mountain State. So just a, a brief overview of 164. Um, so uh, initially you're talking about the Cannabis Control Board and what's going on right now. So uh, Act 164 established a new independent uh, commission within the executive branch that is going to be tasked with running the cannabis program, the adult use cannabis program. They will also be managing the medical program, which is currently um, uh, regulated by the Department of Public Safety. But in 20, in the spring of 2022, that's going to move over under the board. And so they will be regulating both the adult use market and the medical use market. Um, the board is comprised of a chair and two members. Um, they're full-time exempt employees. So this isn't, you know, there's lots of different models for different kinds of boards out there. This is a kind of a full-time job for these three folks who are on the board. Um, they are starting out with two staffers with uh, an executive director who's required to be an attorney. Um, so it's kind of a combination of an ED and a general counsel position. And then there's also an administrative assistant. Um, and so that's just to get the ball rolling with the, with the, the board. Uh, there's also the Cannabis Control uh, Board Nominating Committee and what you were just talking about with Kendall. And so this nominating committee is made up of four legislators and three administrative employees. And, uh, and it is their job to be vetting candidates that the governor um, selects for consideration. And so this is a model that's looking at, um, that, that it's already used in a couple other places in state law. So the governor advertises for the position, collects names, sends those names to the nominating board. And then it's the job of the nominating board to kind of vet those candidates. And then they will select the candidates who they think are well qualified for the position and send those names back to the governor. And then the governor is to select the three positions from that list that the nominating board sends back to them. Um, so timeline, after we go through these slides, I, I'm gonna walk you through the timeline. The timeline is, um, it's we're two months in and it's already blown. So I'll just be honest about that. <laughs> um, uh, I put on there just to note that under the act, um, and sorry, I, had four, I keep uh, inverting the four and the six. So sometimes you might see 146. I don't know why I do that. But um, so Act 164 uh, sets forth a timeline and, the, and they're supposed to, the board members are actually supposed to be seated and start their, their terms next Tuesday. And so uh, I think something that the legislature is going to have to look at this year is how do you readjust the timeline and what does that mean for a lot of the things that you've kind of got stacked up on one another. Um, one of the important issues around the timeline being off is that the board is required to report to the legislature um, this April, April 1st, um, on a number of things. And that's because there were some things that the legislature wanted the board to look at uh, more in depth and then report back to the legislature for the legislature to be able to take action. So the first thing is the resources necessary for implementation for FY22 um, and 23, including positions and funding, because right now what they're going to be doing when the board starts out is they're going to be looking at um, adopting all the rules for the adult use market and the medical market. And 
But once they start accepting applications, once they start having to do site visits and things like that, they're going to need to expand to have enough staffing. And so they're just be coming in in April and kind of doing that build out for the second and third year of the board. Um, another thing is state fees to be charged and collected in accordance with the board's authority. So there's uh, authorization in the act for all sorts of fees from an application fee to license fees. And they are not set in Act 164 that that is uh, the board is directed to kind of come up with a tiering system for all the different types of licenses and to recommend fees to the legislature. But as you well know, the legislature is the one that sets the fees. And so the legislature has to act this year while you are in session to pass a fee schedule so that when the board starts taking applications for licenses in 2022, you've got the fees established. That's not something that would be left to the administration. That's the legislature's job. Um, they're also supposed to look at whether money's uh, expected to be generated by state fees are sufficient to support the statutory duties of the board and whether any portion of the tax money should go towards that. I'll walk you through the money stuff in a minute, but essentially the fees support the regulatory structure and the tax money goes elsewhere. So tax money is not used to support the regulation. Um, there's also uh, so there's also supposed to be reporting back on local fees to be charged and collected in accordance with the board's authority. Um, they're to report on specific criteria under state and federal law with regard to environmental and land use, um, as well as energy efficiency requirements. So a lot of work for this board to do that doesn't exist yet. Um, so I uh, just mentioned the, the money. So the Cannabis Regulation Fund, that is comprised of all the fees collected by the board. Um, there was an initial appropriation in 164 of $650,000 um, uh, so that the board could get up and running. It's made in anticipation of receipts. So, because, so it's gonna be kind of running in the red for a while. Um, if there's a negative balance in the fund at the close of FY22, then tax revenues that come in will be used to kind of backfill that. But the goal of the initial legislation was to have the fees support the regulatory structure. But there's, you know, based on JFO modeling and stuff like that, it's not entirely clear that the fees alone without any tax revenue would be able to, to sustain the work of the board over time. Cannabis taxes, uh, there's a 14% excise tax for retail sales on cannabis. So there's two groups that can sell, it's integrated licensees and retailers. So when they're selling to the public, there's a 14% tax. 30% of that tax is dedicated to substance misuse prevention programming with an annual, annual cap of 10 million. Um, and then there's a 6% 6 6 sales and use tax um, but it's dedicated to a grant fund to start or expand after school or summer learning programs. So it's, uh, so it's earmarked specifically for that. There are several types of licenses or six types of licenses um, that someone can obtain um, if they qualify. There are cultivator licenses. Uh, there are wholesaler licenses, so wholesalers would be doing transport, they might be buying from farms and, and then um, processing them and then selling to product manufacturers. So product manufacturers are folks who would be creating edibles, maybe they're creating creams or tinctures, things like that. Um, there's also testing labs. Um, all of the licensees are required to go and have third party testing, so there'll be these independently licensed labs. And then there's the retailers. The sixth type of license is only available to existing dispensaries. Um, so there are currently five licenses in Vermont for the medical dispensaries, and uh, they are vertically integrated under one license, means they can do everything from cultivate to point of sale. So that's different from what you have under the adult use market, but they would be allowed to obtain this special license and only this five, it wouldn't be open to all the, like in the future, if people apply for a medical that they could then qualify for the integrated. So it's only for these five who have been doing it for several years and they would be able to get an integrated that would allow them to do what they're doing now, but do it for the, for the adult use market. Um, 
folks can only get one type of each license. Um, this was something I think it's a it's a important point, which is um, the legislature was very concerned about making sure they didn't want to have you know big monopolies of the market. And so uh, if you are someone who's looking to go into the market, you can get one cultivator license. You could get a cultivator license and a retail license. You can get any combination, but you can't have more than any, than one of each type of license. Um, to make the sure that you can have lots of point, uh, price points where people can enter the market, the board's gonna develop tiers um, within the licensing categories. They're required to do it for cultivators and for retailers. So you might, somebody might wanna be like a small craft cultivator and have a very small plot. And then they may say, well, I'm just gonna, I'm not gonna sell flour. I wanna just grow that. And then I wanna turn it into my creams and then I wanna be able to sell it to customers. So maybe they would get like the, the lowest tier for each one of those three types of licenses, things like that. And that's what the board's gonna report back to the legislature on in April. There's a list of priorities in licensing and the board's supposed to adopt rules that's gonna build that out. This isn't an exhaustive list of priorities, but I did wanna mention them. Um, they look at whether or not applicants has, have an existing uh, medical dispensary license in good standing, whether the applicants would foster social justice and equity in the industry by being minority or women-owned business whether the applicants propose specific plans to recruit, hire, and implement a development ladder um, for minorities, women, or individuals who have historically been disproportionately impacted by cannabis prohibition. They are to look at whether applicants propose specific plans to pay a living wage and offer benefits to their employees. Um, they're to look at whether the project incorporates principles of environmental resiliency and sustainability, including ener energy efficiency. And they're to look at the geographic distribution of cannabis establishments based on population and market needs. That's gonna be hemmed in a little by whether which towns decide to allow retail sales. And so you have to kind of layer that on top of that. But the goal is that you wouldn't have all of the licensees just clustered in one part of the state, but that they would be distributed throughout the state so that um, people would have access to, to uh, buying cannabis legally. Um, there is not a requirement that it be that licensees be Vermonters, um, but there is um, a benefit to being a Vermonter in this market and the Agency of Commerce and Community Development uh, working with um, ag is directed to provide business and technical assistance to Vermont applicants um, to look at, you know, how they are, uh, start their businesses. The local control issue, I'm guessing y'all probably spend a little time on that one this year. Um, the way that this works is towns have to opt in to allow retail sales of cannabis. Um, all the other types of licensees are would be permitted anywhere in the state, provided they meet all the requirements. But in terms of sales to the public, a town has to take a vote, either at their annual meeting or um, or, or at a special meeting, and they would have to affirmatively put it to the voters, not city council, select board, whatever, to say, yes, we want retail sales in our town. And I think I just heard this morning that um, sounds like Montpelier is the first one to agree to be getting it on the ballot. So, um, so towns, and I've heard a lot, I've been hearing from a lot of legislators about towns that are discussing that right now, whether to put it on the March ballot. Um, Towns do have the ability under their existing inherent authority to regulate businesses. Um, and uh, so whether if they have zoning, things like that, they can do that. They can't pass an ordinance banning essentially cannabis establishments. Um, so it doesn't work that way, but they can regulate under their inherent authority. They can also establish a local cannabis control commission, similar to what they do for liquor right now. And they can issue permits and have conditions under those. We have a hand raised, so Tanya, oh. go ahead. Absolutely, thank you, Madam Chair. I'm wondering if there's been any prioritization given to people who have been harmed by the criminalization of cannabis in the past for licensing. Um, this is uh, up on the priorities right there. So if you look at um, the third, are you talking about the actual applicants? I'm talking about people who have been have gone to jail or who have been charged and and in 
harmed by the fact that in the past cannabis has been um, criminalized. Right. So if you look at number three there, one of the things and priorities is that if an, if an applicant is going to include in their proposal um, plans to recruit, hire, and implement development ladders for minorities, women, or individuals who have been harmed by the war on drugs. Great. So thank you. Part, that, that, that's, a, that's one of the priorities for, for licensing. So you get extra points for that when, when you're in the queue. Wonderful. Um, uh, so related to that, I wanted to point out some of the social equity provisions because I know that that is a big issue and a lot of folks are talking about that and that may be something that people want to build on um, in this legislative session. Uh, so what's in there now is, um, as we just talked about, it establishes licensing priority. Um, it also requires the board to adopt policies and procedures for conducting outreach and promoting participation in the regulated market by a diverse group of individuals, including those who have been dis disproportionately harmed by cannabis prohibition. It creates small cultivator licenses, which lowers the barriers to entry, creating opportunities for uh, minorities who have historically had less access to capital to start businesses and requires prioritization of small cultivators in the initial rollout. So if you, so the first tier of like the first accepting of applications includes those small cultivators. Um, it also prohibits prior nonviolent drug offenses from automatically disqualifying a person as a licensee or an employee of a cannabis business. Um, doing background check, criminal background checks is standard in the industry. Um, despite, you know, how Vermont treats cannabis, it is still a schedule one drug at the federal level. And, um, you know, so there's always a, a, a you, know, you can never kind of forget that. And you have to think about um, how that fits in with what we do at the state level. And so um, there are background checks. It's done currently for people who either own or work in dispensaries. And that would be the same thing in the adult use market. Um, but this is new because um, there's nothing like this in the current medical regulations for, for dispensaries. But this specifically says if you have um, a nonviolent drug offense that doesn't that doesn't automatically disqualify you. They might like factor it in with a bunch of other things, but that's one of the things that the board is to look at developing by rule is how they decide um, on a basis when does somebody's criminal history record essentially disqualify them from either owning or working in a in business. Um, Another hand also up oh. at this moment, uh, Peter Anthony has a question. Yeah, thanks very much. <clears throat> I think since you mentioned it, Michelle, uh, for the sake of our new folks, it was a worry and it continues to be a worry, I think, uh, because of the federal um, imprimatur uh, against um, sort of uh, treating can cannabis like mayonnaise or milk. The worry is financing, uh, because obviously uh, if a person is starting up and is not able to self-finance, they're going to have to go borrow. And that's still, I think, uh, yet to be discovered as to whether or not the normal fluidity of, uh, how would you say, venture capital would be available given the fact that it's illegal at the federal level. Thanks. Sure, thank you. Um, so the, the act also mandates that the board work with Department of Labor, ACCD, and Corrections, um, as well as the Director of Racial Equity, um, to develop outreach training and employment programs focused on providing economic opportunities to individuals who have been disproportionately impacted by cannabis prohibition. So they're going to be doing some outreach and some training um, to try to bring new folks into the market and also to bring people um, from the underground illegal market into the regulated market. Um, and it also creates a position on the Cannabis Control Advisory Committee for a person who has specific expertise in minority and women-owned businesses and another for a person who has expertise in criminal justice reform. So you have the board, which is just the three members, but there's also an advisory board um, that is established. And that is, uh, has a bunch of folks from, who have varied backgrounds um, that relate to or can relate to the cannabis industry. So you have folks who have uh, health experience, ag experience, social justice experience, things like that. And that advisory committee would be doing just that. They would be advising the board on policy. And so there are two folks on that with regard to social equity positions. 
I think I mentioned earlier, the, the cannabis registry is going to um, move from DPS to the board uh, March 1st on 2022. Um, and then when they're doing rulemaking uh, for the adult use, they'll do it also for the medical so that when it shifts over, there's a new uh, statutory scheme that drops down on much March 1st. And then also they would plug into the new rules that were adopted by the board for that. Um, we would assume um, that probably for the next fiscal year budget, there would be something in there that would have the three positions at DPS as well as the money in that fund that, that, that they use to run the program would also switch over to the board. So there's still gonna be a medical dispensary program. That was something that was important to a lot of legislators that um, they thought, you know, you can have an adult use system, but uh, medical dispensaries still provide a unique service to a lot of Vermonters and they wanted that to still be available to those Vermonters. So I just have a little list here of the ways in which there it's different. It will be different, continue to be different from the adult use. Um, so right now, medical cannabis is not taxed and that will continue to not be taxed. So if you are buying from a retail facility, you're paying that 20% tax. If you're buying from a medical dispensary, there is no tax on the products you're purchasing. Um, they're also allowed to deliver cannabis and cannabis products. And they can also um, do, I think in Brattleboro, they have either like a drive-in or a drive up, something like that, because a lot of folks who are, um, are utilizing the dispensaries might have mobility issues. And so this allows the, them to come out of the, of the dispensary and, and deliver it outside to, to the patient. Um, they can also produce and sell cannabis and cannabis products that have a higher THC content than is permitted um, for adult use. The adult use program has certain limits on the amount of THC and, and, and you can't sell certain products like shatter, wax, things like that, that have a higher concentrate, but those are permitted currently for medical patients and those would continue to be um, allowed under the program. Um, and then they're also allowed to sell larger quantities of cannabis and cannabis products than is permitted under the uh, adult use. So in the adult use, it's a maximum of, uh, of an ounce at a time because that's how much every adult in Vermont, 21 and over, is allowed to have as their kind of personal stash aside from any plants that they have and, and anything that they've cultivated from that plant that they keep with the plants. Um, but for medical patients, they can have a little more. They're allowed to have uh, up to two ounces and they have a little higher plant count. And so that will continue for the, for the medical patients. There's some highway safety stuff in there. I, I, you know, this committee typically hasn't really worked much with that, but just to you know, mention it, um, it does allow for evidentiary saliva tests. Um, they cannot, it has to be done with a warrant, just like if uh, there was going to be a request for a blood draw um, to determine whether or not someone was, is impaired. It's um, tricky and controversial because unlike with alcohol, alcohol um, testing, you can correlate the blood alcohol level with impairment and that's and the science just isn't quite there yet for cannabis. Um, so they are really detecting presence of cannabis rather than have saying, you know, you have this much cannabis in your system and this means you're this, this impaired. So um, it's still developing there. And there is legislation in there that says that as soon as there is a device that, um, that, that does determine that and we can adopt that, then DPS is to report to the legislature and we're start to, supposed to start on the path of, of using those devices to detect drug driving. Um, I'm just going to skip that 167. Uh, just so you know there, but there was uh, expungement legislation that passed, but it wasn't in 164, but just so you know, it's out there. So there is a plan to be uh, expunging cannabis convictions for misdemeanors. Um, and then I just wanted to mention the issues for 2021 that might come up that you may be seeing in this committee. Um, first one, is a re-examination of the timeline. So I'm gonna go through the timeline in just a minute um, with you. Then there's the build out for the, for the second and third fiscal years. There's the opt-in, opt-out ballot language. There's a bill that either was just introduced in the Senate or will be soon that tweaks that. 
Um, and I think there's a lot of discussion still around the, uh, around that. I think it, it seems as though just my sense is that there's a lot of towns that are confused. We're getting a lot of calls in, in, in our office, but it's not, you know, once a law passes, it's not a really appropriate for us to be advising towns on how they do this or what their rights are, things like that. And so I think maybe, um, I think Senate government operations is going to have some discussion around the opt in, opt out next week. Um, social equity issues, um, specifically around reduced fees for BIPOC applicants and either no or low interest loans for BIPOC applicants. Um, you're also going to have to see what they come up with regard to the land use, environmental, and energy standards and whether or not you need to take any action there. The legislature is going to need to adopt a licensing fee schedule this year. And then the final thing, I think big thing is advertising. So advertising was a very controversial issue last year with regard to this bill. And, uh, and there, the House Government Operations Committee worked for a long time, those of you who were there worked for a really long time on coming up with a structure for advertising that was pretty comprehensive. And you know, I would say probably, if not the strictest, one of the strictest in the country, but but when it went to the floor, the, there was an amendment on the floor that passed that, uh, that banned all advertising. And so then when it went back to the Senate and then it went to conference, um, Senate was very concerned about the constitutional, potential constitutional implications of a straight up ban. Um, there's really, there's no dispositive case law on this yet. There's no other state that has a regulated market that straight up bans all advertising. Um, it is commercial speech, but commercial speech does is afforded some protections clearly, um, and it is illegal federally. And, and and if it was illegal everywhere, then it you know it wouldn't be an issue. But because it's legal at the state level, um, there's questions about you know whether or not you could just do a straight up ban. Um, and so the legislature, as a compromise in the conference committee, asked the attorney general's office to look at the issue and then to report back to the General Assembly so y'all could take some action on the advertising piece this year. Kanye, did you have a question? I did, but it was answered. Oh, good. <laughs> All right. So is it okay to move on to the, to the timeline? Absolutely. Um, and I will welcome committee members to raise a hand if you have questions along the way. Um, and then when we get done with timeline, we can have a little committee discussion if there's any context that folks who were on the committee last year would like to add um, to the discussion. So thank you. Sure. So now we're gonna walk through the timeline. And so the first challenge with the timeline was, um, you know, generally you, you adjourn in May sometime, right? And then we kind of structure it like, okay, now here, all you folks who are not in the legislature, you have from June to December to do all the stuff the legislature would like for you to do and then come back and let us know so we can have new information to make decisions on these other issues. With the extended session, um, you know, in this bill, you know, it passed the Senate, you know, in 2019, and then it didn't pass, and then it didn't pass the House until actually um, the end of September of 2020, with the extended session. And then the governor, once the governor received it, the governor um, did not sign it, and so it then took effect. So it kind of had a waiting period there. So it actually took effect on October 7th. Um, there are still a lot of specific dates in the bill uh, with regard to kind of when things have to be happening to kind of keep things moving along so you can meet some target dates. So it was supposed to be that the members were supposed to be appointed to the nominating committee on or before November 1st with the governor sending names of the candidates to the nominating committee by November 4th. Um, and then you'll see the kind of the process there. The important thing is, um, you know, if you look at, um, you know, you're, I think you're probably running two months behind, um, but who really knows, you know, with 80 to 90 names, 
I, you know, how long is it going to take for the nominating committee to be able to go through all of those? How, what were the, their, what will their process be? How many are they going to choose to interview and all of the other kind of stuff. So we'll, we'll have to see, but I would say it's pretty safe bet that, that you're probably running two months behind here. And so, um, John Gannon has his hand up. Sure. So let me just explain what happened. Um, so I believe I'm pretty confident that all the legislative appointees to the nominating committee were made by November 1st of 2020. Um, the governor was supposed to send not names by November 4th. However, the application was held open until December 30th of 2020. Um, so that was the, the first um, problem was that instead of having the application process during November, it stretched out to the end of December. Um, we're now in January um, and the nominating committee as of today has yet to receive a single name of a person who applied, even though as we heard from Kendall Smith earlier this morning, um, there's about 80 people who have applied. Um, we are struggling to schedule um, a date for the nominating committee to meet because it appears the administration doesn't understand that the legislature has a pretty packed schedule from Tuesday through Friday. Um, uh, all, all of the legislative members were willing to meet this Monday. However, none of the administrative members, uh, administration members were willing to do that. Um, so that's why I prompted Kendall to understand that it's very difficult um, for a member of the legislature to meet during, um, from Tuesday to Friday. I don't know about other people. My, my day usually starts at least at eight in the morning um, and stretches to four or five at night, if not later. I'm also a select board member. So this week I have had select board meetings every night. Um, so hopefully Kendall will take that message back and we can work on Mondays where we you know, have a lot more time um, to sit down and work through this. Um, you know, unfortunately, I think, you know, if we're lucky, we'll have our organizational meeting for the nominating committee next week. But that's just like appointing a chair, um, figuring out how we're going to review um, the, the applicants. And so it, it's, it, it's going to take some time to, to get through this process. But I think we need to try to work quickly and hopefully schedule meetings on Monday where we can meet for more than one hour. Um, because I think in order to be successful with this process and review applicants, um, it's going to take more than one hour meetings. Thanks, John. Right. So, um, so that means, so if, let's, let, let's say instead of them starting their term and then they would, once the governor appoints the members, then, uh, Senate confirms, which will, you know, would be, I'm sure quick, they would probably just have the three candidates come in front of, and then do interviews, and then they would do confirmation. Um, so then you just have the three board members, but then they have to advertise, interview, and hire for the ED and the administrative assistant. So that's going to take a little bit of time. Um, all the while they're supposed to be, so let's say that if the board gets seated like middle of March, they're not gonna have their ED hired, you know, may, maybe mid-April. Um, but all what they're supposed to be doing actually right now, you know, starting right now is this list that you have here around January to March, the board developing all those things kind of that I talked about. Um, earlier on the slides. Um, so uh, there's a requirements in there around DPS making recommendations around DREs, around drug recognition experts and geographic distribution. That's supposed to happen on or before March 1st. And then April 1st is that date where there's the board's supposed to come back to the legislature and report on all these issues. And so the question is going to be, um, you know, how, how does that need to kind of be rejiggered or does it, or do you do it informally? Because the goal was to get that information while you're still clearly in session. It's pretty late to get that information in a general legislative year. Usually, you know, you're not like discussing fees, you know, starting the discussion of fees in April. But so, um, so folks are going to have to kind of figure out what this means for it and, and whether or not 
there's any way to maintain legislative control over what you need to maintain legislative control over and whether there's other ways for some things to be done either administratively or something like that. Um, they're supposed to appoint, uh, make all the appointments to the advisory committee on or before May 1st. And then on or before June 1st, uh, the board is to begin formal rulemaking for, the, um, for both programs. Uh, July 1st, the new fees would take effect. Um, you know, there won't be any collection of fees for, uh, you know, for several months after that, but it starts with the new fiscal year. Uh, in September, uh, the board is to be working on developing the, the program with DOL and ACCD, DOC, and Director of Racial Equity on the outreach and training um, and employment programs focused on those folks who have been disproportionately impacted by the war on drugs. Um, on or before November 15th and each subsequent uh, November 15th, uh, AG of, Agency of Education has to submit to the General Assembly a plan to fund the grant programs and start the, oh, and start the after school or summer learning program. So with, with regard to the use of that 6% sales tax, how is that gonna be used once it starts getting collected, which will be in FY22, like, but just more in the spring. January 15th, 2022, uh, the board is to report to the General Assembly on the outreach training and employment programs that I just mentioned. February 1st, uh, the cannabis limits that are in current law for dispensaries are going to be lifted and they can start cultivating cannabis and manufacturing products for either transfer or sell to an integrated licensee. So, um, so right now under the medical program, dispensaries can't grow as much cannabis. They don't get to decide how much cannabis they wanna grow essentially is that there's a formula for how much they can grow that's tagged to the number of patients who have specifically designated that particular dispensary as their dispensary. But those limits would, li would lift. And the idea is to try to get the market rolling before you have before you go through and issue all the permits. If you look at all the other states that have a regulated adult use, they have had the existing medical dispensaries go first into the market because they're already set up and they can easily, you know, more easily roll that out. And the goal is to do that so that you can get some revenue coming in. Because remember, up until you start collecting some tax money and some fees you're just running in the red. You know, everything has been fronted to kind of, to get the program running. And so, um, so the, the, the limitations on the amount cultivated um, are lifted February 1st of 2022. Um, board is supposed to have finally adopted the rules by March 1st, 2022. Um, and then at that time, that's when the medical program moves over and then they start doing applications on April 1st. Um, it's tiered so that you don't have everybody kind of swarming the small board at once. We kind of got that recommendation from Washington State, which is one of the first states to do this. And they said, tier it because there's, you don't have to, to issue a license to a retailer at the same time a cultivator because the retailer has nothing to sell until you get the cultivators going. So kind of think about the whole rollout and how that works. So first, here are the uh, small cultivators and the integrated licensees and the testing labs. The, uh, there's also language in there that says that as soon as the small cultivators have some product that they've grown under new license, you can't bring your own illegally grown cannabis into your licensed business and then sell it to dispensaries. But once you grow under your new license, you can sell dispensaries and dispensaries can start selling to the public. And so um, that's that will be in the spring. So the first one is those three groups. Um, then after that, uh, you uh, uh, expand it to all uh, cultivators. Um, then it goes to product manufacturers and wholesalers. And then lastly on there are the retailers. And so you would see, so you're gonna see, um, Sales to the public, I mean, I don't know now with these delays, but according to this is that you would start seeing sales to the public probably uh, in March of 22. 
deals in, by those in, any integrated licensees, so any dispensaries that decide to enter the market, and then you'll see a lot more come on in the fall when you have licensed retailers around the state. There's also we have a, we have a hand raised right now. Um, yep. Sam Lefave. Thank you. I was just clarifying that when we say talk about tax, that we're talking about the tax that is generated from uh, the from people purchasing the product at retailers. Correct. Yes. It's not like okay. So we so from, from what I'm hearing, that tax would start being accumulated in March 22. Correct. Yep. Okay. Thank you. And then just one thing I wanted to end with is that so uh, there's some legislature that said, well, this initial board setup is okay now, but once the program is really off and running, does that same structure still make the best sense? Is it most efficient? Or should we move to a different structure where we've built out a lot more employees within the board and then we take our, our actual board members and move to a different model where maybe they're part-time board members and they're really focused on the policy rather than doing the day-to-day -day work of running the agency, which is really what they're gonna have to do at the beginning until they, until they get the program built out. And so there's a requirement that the auditor of accounts look at all of that and then report to the General Assembly in November of 2023. And then to uh, House Appropriations added a sunset in there for the board. So the board will disappear on July 1st, 2024, unless the legislature goes back and revisits the issue. Um, House Appropriations was concerned that, well, the, maybe the auditor's report comes out and then everybody just sticks it up, you know, under their desk with all the other reports <laughs> and doesn't really do anything with it. And so they put a sunset in there. Thanks, Michelle. And that's what I got. <laughs> Excellent. So um, for committee members, um, returning or new members, um, if you have any questions, uh, comments, observations, now that we've had um, a year to reflect on, uh, on the way the bill has come together. Hal. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I have a question for John. Um, you mentioned that the application process was um, extended to the end of December um, and obviously putting it a couple of months behind now. Any sense of why that was done? No. Okay, thank you. No, not at all. I mean, it's frustrating. I mean, given that we yeah. had a specific timeline that I think was clear to anyone who looked at the legislation. Thank you. Bob Hooper. Uh, thank you. John, I actually was following up on a house question. Did we generally as a state COVID based extend any other sort of just make a general proclamation that timelines were being extended or is this specifically sort of a sandbag? Um, I'm not aware of any executive order that just extended all deadlines um, um, for everything. So, I, I mean, I don't know what happened. I just know that the administrative administration made the decision to hold applications open to December 30th. Um, I did hear that they felt that the process is rushed. And I will acknowledge that working with Michelle, we knew that this was a very tight timeline. So secondly, thank you. Um, <clears throat> Michelle, the language that, that I'm not gonna go back and look for it, but it basically says anybody that's impacted by prior prosecution, et cetera, uh, might have a leg up on this. Seems really vague and broad if you're talking about somebody that's got a tax aversion, federal charge, or you know, God knows what else. Um, is there any kind of guidance that goes with what qualifies, what disqualifies? That seems like uh, a, a very narrow focus committee could exclude an awful lot of people based on that, if they chose to. 
Um, uh, there, is there is not further guidance in the legislation with regard to that. Um, the board through its rulemaking is gonna look at that and kind of build out around kind of how, how to, you know, what are the things there that guide them in those decisions and that is through rulemaking. So it is a public process where people can have the ability to comment on it. Um, however, you know, again, the, the racial equity stuff has uh, kind of come front and center, you know, in the la uh, late of late. And so if there is, I think maybe if people take up that issue in general, maybe we would look at that. Does a legislature want to work on that and look at it? You know, if you, 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 there are programs like that in other states, but oftentimes um, they are in, in somewhat like location based around certain communities that have been um, clearly impacted by, um, by cannabis prohibition, things like that. Uh, what it means for Vermont may not be what it means for in Chicago, right? And so um, I think, I think it's a good point, um, and but I think people are going to be talking about, about it and seeing if it can maybe provide some further guidance, and that will either happen through the legislative process or if not there, definitely at the board uh, board level and through rulemaking. So I'm glad you mentioned there are other areas that have that sort of uh, caveat. Have any of them successfully been challenged on the, hey, why should that person get a better shot than I? Uh, grounds? Uh, I don't know. I haven't, it's not something I looked at. Um, you know, I mean, oftentimes when you're talking about, you know, licensing and you guys probably work with licensing more than, much more than I do, um, you know, there can, there's, it can be in terms of um, a list of things, you know, I don't know how the boards, what they're going to come up with to determine how to issue the permits, but you know, some states use a point system, you know, so you could say, you know, they say, well, you get extra points for this, you get extra points for that and things like that. So it's just about the strength of the application. And, um, and there are some things and I think that Vermont has clearly said, it is uh, important to the legislature that certain things like including people um, of color and including women, including people who have been harmed by the war on drugs are, are given um, some extra points and opportunities to be able to participate in the regulated market. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Rob LeClaire. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. I, um, I guess I have to step up and defend the administration just a little bit here. It does seem fair to think that they've been a little busy for the last 10 months. And when I hear terms like sandbagging, I'm not quite sure that I would have to agree with that. And I do understand the member from Wilmington's frustration. I, I get that. But we also were quite clear, if I remember right, that this was a tight timeline. And when you have all the different obstacles that came into place from being busy to people working remotely, um, I, I think that the administration deserves a little slack here on maybe not being quite timely, but thank you. <clears throat> well, being members of the legislature, it is always our job to, um, to protect the timeline that allows the legislature to weigh in on the next steps in the process. So uh, we do need to be able to work together to, uh, to meet the timeline so that the legislature in 2021 can um, take the next steps. So we can hope that there's an opportunity to make up lost ground. Uh, any other questions from committee members? All right, I see Hal and Rob with hands up, but I think that was from previous questions. So um, Michelle, thank you so much for, uh, for giving us a, a speed through of the cannabis bill and the timeline. And um, we look forward to uh, seeing what continuing conversations evolve about how to strengthen the the plan that we've set in place. Sure. Thanks so much for having me in.